Hello and welcome to our Voices in Montessori podcast. As Dr. Montessori said, an education capable of saving humanity is no small undertaking. We agree, so let's get to work. My name is Tamara Sheasley Ballas, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about social emotional learning in the lower elementary classroom. My guest today is our very own Jen Naiman. Jen has a master's degree in counseling with specializations in school counseling and mental health counseling, and she is currently the director of student support at Greenspring Montessori School. Welcome, Jen. We're so happy to Thanks have you here today. for having me. We've been talking about this for a long time. We have. I'm really <laughs> excited to be here. Um, and I'm looking forward to discussing how to teach and practice emotional learning at the lower elementary level. We, As we know, they are in the sensitive period for that. And really, we want to help them by giving them the tools they need to really be successful. So, so Jen, we're going to dig right in here. And I'm going to ask you to start out by telling us what, what is social emotional learning? So social emotional learning is how we help our children develop their emotional intelligence starting at a very young age. So it's their building of their relationship skills. It's the building of their empathy skills. It's self-regulation. It's executive functioning, all of the above. Mm. There's so much in there, right? Yeah. There's so much in there. And for us, at least we're seeing that children have a greater need post pandemic for these skills. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of time was lost. There was a lot of extra screen time, even screen time that was intended for education. Mm -hmm. But during that time, children were not outside playing with one another. They mm -hmm. were not exploring the environment through their hands and through their bodies. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time was lost in which we would be learning naturally through our environment. Mm -hmm. And I think the masks had a, a, an impact as well. I think children mm -hmm. didn't have that experience of getting to see every adult's face, mm -hmm. to watch the emotional cues, to see the mouth moving. So there's, mm -hmm. we have some work to do to support our children and really compensating for those two years. So, okay. So let's talk about why social emotional learning is so important. Mm -hmm. Well, social emotional learning is something that ultimately helps us be the best that we can be as human beings, mm -hmm. not just as young children, but well into adulthood. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's so important to help our children with their social emotional skills and their character building mm -hmm. and their emotional intelligence building from such a young age. And, you know, I know we're talking about the elementary age child now, but this goes back even to at the time of birth mm -hmm. or even before birth, when a parent is talking to their child, even in the womb, mm -hmm. um, we are learning how to modulate our voices to interact with the world in a way that helps others and ourselves feel most comfortable, safe, secure, seen, and soothed. And that comes from Tina Prain, Bryson, and Daniel Siegel's work. We love them, <laughs> um, right? Love them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, and I was just reading Atlas of the Heart this weekend, and uh, Dr. Brene Brown was also talking about social emotional skills and that self-knowledge of our emotions and the emotions of others, how it doesn't just impact our social relationships. It actually impacts how we feel about ourselves. It impacts whether if we can name the feeling or we can see it in someone else, mm -hmm. it builds us academically. It builds us, it builds us in the work environment. Mm -hmm. Like it, it impacts every part of our life. Yes. And so it's interesting because these have been dubbed as soft skills, mm -hmm. yet these are the skills that for many people are really what make it the most, are, are so important in their effectiveness and in how they do in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, the quality of our relationships with others is the best indicator of the quality of our life overall. That's right. So really learning these skills when we are young and absorbing them when we are young mm -hmm. to then have them well into adulthood when we're going and we're getting jobs out in the world, when we're interacting with people out in the world, when mm -hmm. we 
when we have a, a partner one day that we're going to be interacting with and our children, these skills are crucial. And really it's the foundation for all other forms of learning to take place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for those of you who are interested in digging in more to that, just so you know, um, Harvard has the Harvard Longevity Study. I think they're at about 65 years now, and they've been studying the same group of people for that time. And they have really found what Jen, I'm just underscoring what you just mm -hmm. said, Jen, that the, the people who have the strong skills in building a healthy relationship have the highest quality of life mm -hmm. overall, mm -hmm. overall. And so um, if you have a few minutes, you might want to check that out. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, so let's talk about how social emotional learning fits into the second plane of development. Mm -hmm. Well, in the second plane of development, our children are they're coming out of this absorbent period where they have just taken everything in like a sponge for the first six years of their life. Mm. And now they are expanding. They are becoming, they're wondering why, why are things happening in the universe around me? Mm. How do I fit into the universe around me? Um, and children are able to, at this point, distinguish between reality and imagination. So mm. using imagination is actually a really powerful tool and role play mm -hmm. um, and modeling to teach social emotional learning at the elementary level. Mm. Um, so some things that we might do, we use a lot of what's what's called bibliotherapy at the mm. elementary level to teach social emotional learning. So you may take a book that has characters in it. They could be real characters or they could be imaginative characters. And they will have, they will be overcoming some sort of social emotional hurdle, let's say, mm. or being introduced to something that's new, like, like certain social conflicts that don't arise really until this age, about seven, eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. And, and those books talk about how the character works through those challenges. And then mm. the child might say, Hmm, I have a similar challenge. I wonder how I could work through that. And what some of these books offer is they offer this powerful language mm. that the child can then use in their own life. Um, and then really that can become part of, part of the classroom culture, not just the classroom culture, but the culture at home too. Mm -hmm. I want to really underscore the power of language. Language is so important for labeling situations, labeling feelings, labeling emotions, and through language, we can work through so many more challenges than without it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. like if you've ever had a feeling like you're feeling, I'm so frustrated, but I'm really not frustrated. I'm something else, but you can't think of what that language is. Mm -hmm. So social emotional lessons can really support our child, children in finding other forms of language to express what they are going through and therefore how they can resolve that, mm. situ that conflict or any situation mm -hmm. they're having. Well, it also, I mean... Dan Siegel says you name it to tame it, mm -hmm. right? So if you can have the language, if you have your helped, if you've helped a child to build that skill, they then can identify what they're feeling mm -hmm. and then, then they can process it. it what, mm -hmm. what happens when we don't name it is it gets bottled or bro we brood mm -hmm. on it or, and we teach them to stuff it, mm -hmm. which is, as we know, as adults, we still work through some of that, right? Mm -hmm. And it it can cost us for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So really, I think that this is such a critical component of any healthy mm -hmm. classroom, Montessori or not, mm -hmm. any healthy classroom is teaching these skills and these tools. Right. And I will say also teaching it explicitly, you know, we didn't, Way back when we didn't used to have to teach a lot of these skills explicitly. Mm. Children were out and about so much more. They, you know, the way we used to interact as children, we would ride our bikes and we mm. would knock on people's doors unannounced. Mm. You know, it would we had more of a spontaneous childhood in general. I'm not speaking to one particular generation, but I'm really speaking to generations that were pre um pre-screen time, pre-technology, uh, pre-individual pre personal. Right. device. <laughs> so children naturally socialize with each other more, mm -hmm. um, at least in person mm -hmm. than they do today. And so they you know, picked the up, closer to oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> so they picked up on some of these social skills mm -hmm. in a different way than they do now. Mm -hmm. Um, so as before, we might not have had to explicitly teach, you know, when someone is backing away from you, that actually means maybe you're not giving them enough space. Mm. So, so 
But that was once automatic. Children mm-hmm. would pick up on that without ever having being taught. Mm-hmm. In today's world where our children, quite frankly, I feel like are socially starved to some extent mm-hmm. because of the tech, the extra technology usage that we are seeing today. Um, they have to learn these skills more explicitly at first and then through practice they can mm-hmm. really learn them and it can become a part of themselves and their culture. Mm-hmm. Well, I also have to say, I think it's I think it's technology. I agree with you. And I think there's a component that we're seeing where people are protecting their children so much that they're keeping them mm-hmm. home. Mm-hmm. We, people can live in neighborhoods where there, there's no other children out playing. Mm-hmm. At one right. point, I literally, we were we were stalking somebody who had put up a a turning eight birthday sign Mm -hmm. in their yard. And we went to their house four times to knock on the door to, to have somebody in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Because my daughter, of course, goes to my school, you know, my Mm -hmm. children have gone to my school. And so anyway, I think that's another component is there's just not that neighborhood group that gets together anymore. Mm -hmm. And and so, and that also contributes to nature deficit. So unless you explicitly make it a point. Unless you build it. Right. But right. even those, like we have a commitment to that and we mm-hmm. try, we, you know, so anyway. Absolutely. Okay. So, so let's talk about how it fits into the Montessori curriculum. How does this, how do we, how do you build this in? So social emotional learning lessons in general slide right into grace and courtesy, courtesy lessons. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we have community meetings at the beginning of every day. That is the perfect time to reinforce the language of any social emotional language is given. We can have a social emotional shelf in the classroom with mm-hmm. all of the work from the explicit lesson mm-hmm. that we may have already gone over, both mm-hmm. in a in a one on, you know in a whole group lesson mm-hmm. and during community time. Mm-hmm. And then every time a child will pull a work on, off of that shelf that it, that talks about, let's say, either a tattling versus reporting lesson, a personal space lesson, which we're going to get into. Don't worry. Jen's going to give you those. A volume of your voice lesson. Mm -hmm. Work for that can all be put on a shelf and then reinforced throughout the work cycle Mm -hmm. as it is. Mm -hmm. And even more so the guide can be the one reinforcing the language just as a part of their everyday encounters with the children. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I love that. Okay. So there's so, it sounds like there's so much to do and I'm assuming you give group lessons, but you also give individual lessons mm-hmm. when it comes up with children, mm-hmm. you you can reinforce one of the things we have to remember human beings forget, mm-hmm. right? If we yeah. haven't built it as a habit, you can't give one lesson and then expect them to have it mm-hmm. right. We're going to, we're and Jen in a second is going to talk about the lesson, some of the lessons that you've mm-hmm. given successfully and really have impacted our community in such a positive way. And, but we have to remember that these have to be reinforced and it means reminders. It means giving the lesson again, if you see it coming up over again, Mm -hmm. we can't say for adults or children, Mm -hmm. oh, it's one time, one and done, (laughs) right? There's no one and done. This is, you know, a consistent building process for the community. Just like when we're learning language in general, when Mm -hmm. we are infants, we, our parents are saying the same words over and over and over and over to us again, until mm-hmm. we really absorb it, until we really learn it. Mm. Language is not learned from being a one and done. Right. It's learned from the way our brain works. It, we have to hear something over and over and over again. And we not just have to hear it, we have to live it. So we have to be doing it with our hands. You know, social emotional learning really is a language, just like any other language. Emotional Mm. intelligence Mm -hmm. really is a language. So we Mm. have to build it over time. Mm. And, um, you know, what, what we notice in today's world is that a lot of our children are learning the language of a screen during a very prime window for language acquisition Mm. between really between the ages of birth and six or seven years. Mm -hmm. Um, But if our very young children Mm -hmm. are really just giving more of their time to technology than they are to human interaction, Mm -hmm. they're actually losing a really important time period in their life where language is the most crucial Mm -hmm. to be absorbed. So we're trying to work around that as, you know, we're in a, we're in really an age of technology. And this is not to say that all technology is, is bad. There is so much good that we have in our world of technology. It's just something to be aware of as we are 
supporting our children in developing their emotional intelligence, emotional skills. Well, and the skills. truth is that as Montessori educators, we don't really get to decide how much technology the child has at home. Right. We can educate, but what we have to do is what Dr. Montessori told us is that we have to meet and greet the child who shows up mm -hmm. and that the parent, the parents is a separate piece, right? So, so how do you support children in these lessons? Like what are the lessons that you feel like are, are really valuable for that age, especially lower elementary? Mm -hmm. Let's just frame lower elementary. Yeah. They come in, they are so right They're They are leaving the age of, of, of of really order mm -hmm. what Dr. Montessori called them. They, they enter the age of rudeness, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden they're, you know, everywhere, their brain is literally pruning all of the, their neuro pathways that are not being used. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's also another reason we need to sure. underscore these lessons and they can be just everywhere. And, and it's, what's so interesting is we find that a lot more social issues come up at that age. Like all yes. of a sudden a child who may have gotten along so well with others, all of a sudden is having these moments with other people where they're struggling in mm -hmm. their relationships. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. talk about some of the, of the lessons that you recommend. And these sure. are ones that are not built into our albums folks. So, <laughs> you know, it's not like Dr. Montessori could have anticipated all these things that we need. So we have to really pay attention to what the needs are and meet those needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And there are so many lessons that we could focus on. I just want to say that I'm going to yeah. try to keep it to just a few for here. <laughs> we for don't today. have all day. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, something that that comes up a lot in lower elementary specifically is the need for personal space. Mm. So when we say, you know, as as educators, if we say, you know, I need personal space. Or if you, if a parent says that to a child, I need personal space that actually often goes way over the child's head That's right. because personal space can actually be broken down in so many different ways. And here we go. We're talking about language again. So mm. personal space really is, is a broad category. Mm -hmm. And so when we're working with lower elementary children, we want to be specific. So they have specific language to describe what they are feeling or thinking or experiencing. Mm -hmm. So personal space can actually be broken down into four different types. We hmm. have seeing space, hearing space, body space, and property space. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, well, body space is actually what we generally think of as personal space. Mm -hmm. It's it's when somebody is too close to us physically or too far away from us. We might say, I need a little, I need some space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, if I'm coming really close to you, you might actually back up. Let's say that. Oh, so you're okay. going to back up. Okay. Tamara, Tamara. Which actually that happens, right? Mm, yes, that happens. that happens. Yes. As educators and right. as parents, right? <laughs> you know, and even with children, you watch children, right? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's a time where we can actually say to a child, you know what, if somebody is moving their body back away from you, that is an indicator that you might be invading their body space. Mm -hmm. Huh. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, and these are things, again, we might have picked up on naturally a long time ago, mm -hmm. but we we don't necessarily anymore. Our children don't necessarily anymore. Even some adults mm -hmm. don't always pick up on this mm -hmm. naturally. Mm -hmm. So this would be a time to say, hmm, is Tamara, is Tamara staying upright with you when you're speaking or is she backing away from you? Oh, she's backing away. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, that must mean I'm a little bit too close to her. Okay. Well, what could I do? maybe I can move back a little bit so mm -hmm. that I'm respecting her body space, mm -hmm. not invading it. Mm -hmm. So using those words, you know, either invade or respect, mm -hmm. and then identifying it's not just personal space, it is body space specifically. Mm -hmm. Another way that we can explicitly teach that lesson is by taking a hula hoop and putting one around our body mm -hmm. and saying, if somebody were to go under the hula hoop, that would be invading that person's, mm -hmm. you know, invisible bubble for their body space. Mm -hmm. If we're outside the rim, you can get as close to the rim as possible, even touching it. Mm -hmm. And you're still okay. You're within the right range. Mm -hmm. Then we might talk about with a visual, well, there's actually different size hula hoops for different situations. Someone you're really close with, mm -hmm. like a parent or caregiver, maybe a close friend, mm -hmm. a, close, a close guide, 
you might have a smaller hula hoop around you. So your personal mm. space bubble, your body space bubble mm -hmm. is actually smaller than it might be around someone that you don't know, or you're not as comfortable with. Mm -hmm. In that case, your hula hoop, your invisible bubble would be larger. Mm -hmm. Well, and what, what I really love about that is you're talking to them then about how different people have different needs. Cause even mm -hmm. as an adult, I notice that sometimes when I come up to talk to somebody, they may take a step back mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I realize, oh, they have a need for more space than I do. Yes. And there's, yeah. it's not personal, sure. right? It's every human being is a little different. We're all these amazing, we're amazing individuals. Mm -hmm. So you get to teach the children that there's all that individuality also built into this social, emotional learning. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, we, we learn together in that moment to say, to actually advocate for ourselves mm. or really not. I say, I say us, because this is the same for adults and for children, lower elementary children. Like we can advocate for ourselves and say, I need some body space, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. so often we won't say anything. We won't advocate for our own needs and how empowering is it That's if right. the child can advocate their, for their own needs? That's right. That's so, right. you know, what you tend to hear, if you use this language enough in the lower elementary classroom, you will start to hear the children saying, huh, that's invading my body space or thank you for respecting my body space. They're using that language as mm -hmm. part of their everyday culture. So is the guide. Mm -hmm. And so the, you know, the children with their mirror neurons at, at a heightened state, you know, mm -hmm. at this, at this stage, mm -hmm. they are watching their guide mm -hmm. and saying, oh, okay. My guide is saying that's mm -hmm. invading her body space mm -hmm. or, you know, please give me a little bit of extra <laughs> room. And they're going to model after that and repeat that. Oh, well, and I, I really appreciate that. I wonder how we could also work with them because I love respecting the term respecting. And I wonder if there's a term we could use because if somebody said to me, you're invading my body mm. space, I would feel a little like, oh, like, so like that's a power, like a big word. It's a big yeah. word. It's a powerful word. And we can use it in the lesson. We should be using it in the lesson, I think, mm -hmm. because it's, it's so powerful. And it's almost another grace and courtesy lesson separately Sure. to say, I wonder if you could give me a little bit more body, body space. space. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, may I have a little extra body space? Right. Right. My, as a my personal space bubble is a little bigger than this. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. And I exactly. mean, yeah, what's ironic is Jen and I are like right up against each other right now in the podcast studio and probably very much in each other's personal space bubbles right now. Right. Yes. But, but it's okay because we know each other and we're closer. So our, our bubbles are a little bit smaller. That's right. Okay. And we made a decision because to be on screen together that we were going to, we're, we're very intimate, right? Yes. Now. It's a very intimate setting. So, okay. So I love that. Love that. Okay. So tell us another one. So there's, so there's body space and then we have yeah. seeing space. So usually when somebody says you're in my personal space or I need personal space, they're not actually thinking of seeing space. So seeing space is when something, an object is either too close or too far away from our eyes. Mm. So if you have ever been a guide, which I know many of you have, <laughs> you know that sometimes a child would like to come up to you and, and be really excited about their work and put it right to your face. Oh, your eyes, right to your eyes. <laughs> And what happens when something is right at your eyes? Right. You can't read it. You That's can't right. see it. And That's it's right. kind of uncomfortable, right? That's right. That's so right. this is a time when you can say to a child, huh, may I have a little bit of extra seeing space? Mm -hmm. And that indicates to the child, oh, something is too close mm -hmm. to my guide's eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, parents have this too a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many times when, when my son was younger, he would come home and want to show me these incredible art projects that he did. And he would just show them so close to my eyes as if I couldn't see them, if they were like mm -hmm. two extra feet away. And, you know, I would back up and I would, I would say, oh my goodness, that is way too close to my eyes. Mm -hmm. And that was actually before I had my my um language on seeing space so that's a good then one too. once I learned it I'm like can I have a little extra seeing space because going that is too close to my eyes didn't actually change the behavior oh interesting but my my child actually he took it a little bit further away but not nearly enough to really understand what that meant that something's too close you know it's kind of like being right. 
here versus there, which is still too close. But it's also not giving teaching the lesson in the same right. way. Like seeing mm -hmm. space is a really nice reinforcement mm -hmm. of our needs as human beings. I right. really love that. And then there's hearing space, right? Yeah, but hang on, we're still oh. on seeing space. Oh, so, okay, great. So seeing space can also be with an object is too far away from someone's eyes. Oh, either way, it can make the other person feel some discomfort. So the way that this would actually be taught in an explicit lesson, it's actually, there's a lot of humor used oh. in it. So, and humor is great for children who are in the second plane of development. Mm -hmm. They feel like they are very much engaged and in part of that lesson, especially when they get the jokes, mm -hmm. they get the humor. They mm -hmm. feel so, they feel mature. They feel like a part, they feel like a part of the lesson process. Mm -hmm. They feel like a part of the teaching process. Mm -hmm. So one way I might teach this, I will be reading them a book. Actually, the book is called Personal Space Camp by Julia Cook. Okay. Um, a wonderful mentor had introduced this to me. Her name is Lori. Um, okay. Just real quick, we'll put that in the show notes for you all. It, so when, if you're listening to the podcast, we'll we'll list, get that in the show notes for you. So I will take the book that I'm reading and I will say, okay, who wants to who wants to be my volunteer for me to invade your seeing space? It's all done through role play, by the way, to teach this. Um, so I will take the book and I they they have no idea what's coming, and mm -hmm. I will say hey, can you read this page for me? And I'll hold it this close to their eyes. Mm. And then the child's like, no, I can't read it. And I'll say, why not? And mm. they'll say, because it's too close to my face. It's, and I'll go, oh, is it too close to your eyes? Yes. Oh, okay. What can you ask me? Can I have some seeing space? Mm. Sure. And mm. then that's my indicator. I'm going to back up a little bit mm -hmm. and I'll say, is this good? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll do a check-in. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. that is good. And then the child will be able to read it. Then I'll take the exact same example mm -hmm. um, for seeing space. And I will say, who wants to be my volunteer so I can invade your seeing space again a different way. And I'll take the book and I will hold it really, really far away. I'll walk mm -hmm. to the other end of the classroom. Say, who can read this? I can't read this. That's too far away from my eyes. The print is too small. And then we say, mm -hmm. oh, am I invading your seeing space? What mm -hmm. can you ask me? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you oh. come a little closer. <laughs> so it's That's advocating. Right. That's right. Um, but anyway, that also gives language because when somebody does hold something mm -hmm. too close to or too far away from our eyes, it does mm -hmm. make us feel uncomfortable, which goes under that umbrella of mm -hmm. personal space. Yeah, so. that, those are so helpful. And the concept of things being outside your seeing space and invading your seeing space really make a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, so then there's sound too, right? There's hearing space. Yeah. So hearing space can be invaded when somebody, we tend to think when somebody's too loud, mm -hmm. that can, you know, and that does invade our hearing space. That can mm -hmm. make the other person mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Truthfully, it might make the person who's being really loud uncomfortable too, especially if they're in a heightened state or if they're really mm -hmm. angry or frustrated for some reason. Um, or amped up. Or amp, yeah. Right. Yeah. They don't even have to be angry or frustrated. Right. They could be. Mm -hmm. But they could also be really excited. Yeah. They could be nervous. They, their, their nervous system is amped up. Right. And totally unaware of right. how loud their voice is. And I be. think all of us who've been teaching for a while know that there are also children and adults mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. come in who don't, who come in loud anyway. Yeah. Even when they're at peace, where right? they just, they don't necessarily have that regulation. Right. Right. So, so part of hearing space, how that is taught, we, we actually, this is something you will really very rarely ever see in a Montessori classroom, but for this lesson, it is part of the teaching. Explicitly. I'm on the edge of my seat so, here. I might say to the children, okay, on the count of three, I want you to scream your name oh as gosh. loud as you possibly can. And so the kids, get, the children get all amped up for this. They're mm -hmm. really, really excited. And so then on the count of three, they all scream to like the point where you have 27 children in a classroom, the walls are vibrating. And what does everybody do? Right. They're all holding their ears shut because it is so loud. It is so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then of course, with lower elementary students, the ones get, that get really carried away with it have a hard time stopping. So we take our little bells. <laughs> We actually practice stopping screaming before we do the exercise. Oh, that's so that, a great idea. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because it's such a fun, exciting, humorous right. lesson. 
that you could actually get a little carried. Well, and I, I think that's an important point, not just for this, but for any time you're doing something is to, you're setting the expectation ahead of time mm -hmm. so that the children know how to be successful within yes. the framework, because you're actually amped, amping them up by mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. And so you're get, making sure that they know what the expectation is afterwards. Right. Mm -hmm. So right after we all stop screaming, let's mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. we actually talk about what that was like. And I kid you not, there are sometimes children that are actually crying at the end of it, especially ones that are really sensitive to sound oh. at some point. Oh. Um, and, and they're not actually upset about anything, but it's kind of like when you, when you hear a fire drill, Sometimes as a, as a lower elementary child, even though you know it's coming, mm -hmm. you know that this is something that is routine and it's really to keep us safe, mm -hmm. it still can be very startling, mm -hmm. those loud mm -hmm. noises. Mm -hmm. So we actually get to see in real time mm -hmm. what, it, what it can be like, how it can feel, how it can make somebody else feel uncomfortable when somebody is too loud. Mm -hmm. So that's a time to say, or to practice saying, to do that role play, hey, would you mind speaking a little bit quieter? Mm -hmm. You know, and practicing advocating for oneself and also practicing giving feedback to another person. Mm -hmm. That is such a valuable life lesson. There it are is. so many adults who don't know how to take feedback. So that's another, that's a whole another different topic. topic. But, you know, it's something that so many of these social emotional lessons can really overlap with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's just a small portion of, you know, the, this whole lesson on personal space. It's in part giving feedback to another person. And well, then the other person taking that. I, I, and I think that's so important. And you're doing it before you get amped up. Like if yeah. you watch a lot of even adults, they don't say anything, don't say anything, don't say anything. And then they get resentful mm -hmm. and frustrated. That's mm -hmm. because they haven't advocated for themselves. Mm -hmm. And then it comes at the other person. Right. And I just want to add one thing, like when you're doing that activity with the, with the children in the classroom, you can also ask them because what a nice way for them to own their own experience to say, mm -hmm. if you're somebody who loud noises are, um, hard for, you may want to step back from yes. the circle, right. And give yes. them, and then they get to start to pay attention to who they are as an individual and how they meet their own needs. Absolutely. Yes, you know, yes. so that they then then maybe you won't have the tears. <laughs> right, right. No, <laughs> not the tears are it's always, not, we're it's not, not avoiding. tears in a bad, it's not tears right. in an I'm sad or upset way. It's just, it's like a it's startled way. It's Even though there is a lot of prep before the, the activity. Yep. And of course, for some groups, if, if I'm going in as the guide, knowing yes. that this is, this could be triggering for some students, then yes. we will do it a different way. And mm -hmm. that might look like I'm the one that actually screams really loudly and says hi my name is jen like just you know or and you then, ask for a volunteer right, one volunteer right right, right exactly yeah. and i don't want us to get caught here yeah. so yeah, yeah. so so then but hearing space can also be the opposite of being too loud it can also be being too quiet again another thing that we don't mm. really think of but really this pertains to anything that can make somebody else feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. so if you are whispering, so how I might do this one is I might say to the class, I might actually ask a question, but I will be whispering, like silent. Actually, I won't even be whispering. I'm pretty just, pretty much just moving, moving my mouth. So like, <laughs> if I start saying, talking to you like this. Right. Can you, I can't what, hear you, Jen. Right. What are you doing? You're, you're going to be leaning in a little mm -hmm. bit more. So mm -hmm. that's another physical sign. If somebody's really leaning into you, that means they can't hear you. Mm -hmm. That means that maybe their hearing space mm -hmm. is, is, I know we don't love this word invading, but it's making somebody to the point that they're having to lean their neck in because mm -hmm. they can't mm -hmm. hear you. If that's kind of uncomfortable to not be able to hear someone who, you know, is trying to communicate with you is mm -hmm. talking and talking and talking. And you keep saying, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. And mm -hmm. well, actually that's what we do as, as adults, but mm -hmm. elementary, you know, lower elementary age children might just pretend they heard someone or oh, yeah. then, you know, <laughs> do something 100%. else. Um, but this is again, advocating for ourselves. Mm -hmm. but we're, we are teaching the lesson at this point mm -hmm. that, you know, when you can't hear somebody, that's also a time when we need to say, mm -hmm. I can't hear you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, can we can we speak up a little bit? Mm -hmm. And so for a child who is naturally more reserved or shy, this is a really great lesson in, well, how can I be a little bit louder mm -hmm. while still being comfortable and true to myself? Mm -hmm. So so that's 
That's I, another one. I just want to, this is totally <laughs> off topic topic, but I think it's worth mentioning. We have six year seminar and we've got a couple of students in six year seminar who are very, very, very quiet mm -hmm. people. They, you know, they just, that's a piece for them. Mm -hmm. And our six year seminar guide got a bullhorn and had them share through the bullhorn and they loved it. They loved it. It was so interesting to give them access to being mm -hmm. that loud, but not out it. And I know that's off topic, mm -hmm. but I thought it was worth sharing because that. isn't that just such a nice way to meet yes. them? Well, it's not, it's not even so off topic because one of the points I'm trying to, to convey here is that every social emotional lesson, even mm -hmm. if we we're saying it's a very specific one, everything's intertwined. Mm -hmm. It's all part of this, this grace and courtesy mm -hmm. from one lesson, you practice another lesson. Yeah. And then over time, each of these lessons build upon one another so that it all just becomes natural. I love that. Um, so, yeah. well, anyway, I'll get to the last one. Cause I know I could just go on and on about this property space. Okay. So this one in particular is probably more common in a lower elementary classroom than any other you know, division or, or, you know, I would say even plane of development for children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is property space is when somebody is touching your property mm -hmm. or taking your things, or even if it's not your personal property, if it's something you're using, if it's a work that you are working on and someone comes up and touches it or steps on it or kicks it, then that's invading someone's property space. Mm -hmm. How would you feel, you know, if somebody took your cup someone you like, even if it's someone you're friends with and you're close with, and they just took your cup and started walking around with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would that feel? Mm -hmm. I would not like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't, we don't like when people touch our stuff without asking permission first, mm -hmm. letting us know that they're borrowing something, mm -hmm. you know, and this is really a lesson in asking first, mm -hmm. may I borrow your cup? May I borrow your pencil? Are you finished with this work? Mm -hmm. May I have a turn now? Mm -hmm. You know, in but in the Montessori classroom, it's always going to go back on the shelf right, before right. they take it out again. So that mm -hmm. just, you know, yeah. for clarity's sake, they're going to, they may say, you left this out and you're at snack. Mm -hmm. How sure. much longer do you think you might be working on it after it, you yes. know, like I'm waiting for this. You know, so I right. think there's some of that at play. Too. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But I'm not just talking about in the classroom itself. I know yeah. I mentioned work, but even when you're outside, let's at, say, and you're place. at recess, right. yes. you know, somebody is using that shovel yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and maybe even they put it down for a minute. That's a big one. But what if, right. what if they just turn to talk to a friend who was also in the sandbox or they're getting another tool or they're get right. Right. Yep. And then somebody comes up from you behind and takes it. Yeah. It can feel like somebody just took my property that mm -hmm. I was still utilizing. I That's was still right. working on. I love so that. Yep. you'll notice in an elementary, a lower elementary classroom specifically, mm -hmm. this comes up a lot, believe it or not, with pencils, mm -hmm. writing utensils, <laughs> you know, when there, when there's a colored pencil or a marker that somebody put down, but they were still using, mm -hmm. you know, to, to adults, this seems like a very small problem, but to children in this in this plane of development, it's really big. Mm -hmm. That that mm -hmm. feels very unjust. Mm -hmm. So a child might have a big reaction to something mm -hmm. that's really kind of small uh -huh. in uh -huh. the in the grander scheme of things. But this lesson can help give children the language of, you know, I'm still using that, or hey, this is my water bottle. Mm -hmm. Do you mind just leaving it where it is? You know, mm -hmm. even if a child is trying to be helpful and they see that somebody left their water bottle on the table, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. that child actually knows that it's there. And mm -hmm. maybe the child who it belongs to actually wants to take their water bottle off the table and put it in their backpack themselves, mm -hmm. you know? So it's just a, it's just really a lesson in asking before mm -hmm. taking or touching something that does not belong to you. Well, so, or, or that in, and there's so still much communal, use. right. In yeah. Montessori, which is part of the design. We want to teach delayed right. gratification, right? We need to reinforce that. So it's part of the beauty of it. Right. Great. Exactly. Great. So, so those are specific grace and courtesy lessons that you can incorporate. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Great. With um, a lot of role play. 
with a lot involved. of role and play. that's more that's also the the follow up that's right that's right yeah. okay so i i know you have some other lessons for us <laughs> i do yeah please <laughs> okay so another one that's really common in the lower elementary environment is tattling versus reporting hmm. so because children at this plane of development are so focused on social justice and making sure things are fair mm -hmm. we want to support them mm. in when something is a little problem on this problem thermometer or a much bigger one mm -hmm. so a child might really feel the strong urge to go up to the guide and say, Johnny took my pencil and, and, you know, and I'm so angry and the world is over and, you know, that's dramatizing it, but right. to the child, it actually feels like a really, really big thing. Or let's say that somebody, I keep using the pencil only because, you know, when I've, when I've taught in this, <laughs> in this age division, everything seemed to be about a pencil. Okay. Um, or, or going to the bathroom or something mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, Another one might be like, Johnny is taking way too long in the bathroom. It's my turn to go. You know? mm -hmm. And this is a chance where we can say, hmm, let's talk about what tattling versus reporting is. Tattling. Tattling is something, this is what we would teach explicitly, that you might re say to somebody, say to a guide, ask for help for something that actually you could problem solve on your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, you could find a different bathroom. Mm -hmm. You could ask to use a different bathroom if you really have to go. Mm -hmm. If Johnny is tapping his pencil on the desk and it's bothering you so much, well, you could move too. Mm -hmm. You know, what a- You what could a say gift. first, you would say, mm -hmm. you're tapping your pencil. Right. You can try That's, to resolve the right. problem first. Yes. That's distracting me from my work. Would you mind stopping? Right. We don't know if Johnny actually has Total control over or awareness pencil, or awareness around <laughs> right. pencil tapping. He may end right. up doing it again. Yeah. And then you could also move, right? There's a, you can mm -hmm. problem solve. So what you're saying yes. is that the things that would be tattling are things that the child has the capacity to problem solve themselves. Yes. And we want to support that. I mm -hmm. want to be super clear that classrooms that have somebody who's coming in constantly and solving the problems for the children they're not getting a Montessori education, right? They, because the problem solving, and it's so key to social emotional learning is actually being able to recognize your own frustration or mm -hmm. distraction or annoyance, and then think about what you could do mm -hmm. rather than running and telling an adult, which oftentimes we find children that that's what they've been taught. You know, yeah. they can, somebody says, well, did you tell the teacher? Right? Yes. Yes. That is the common traditional line. And it drives me crazy. Right. You know, if you, when you walk into some classrooms, I'm not going to say all, but you know, you walk into some and you will see the hands of almost every child raised asking the teacher for help. Can you help me with this? Can you help me with this? And some of these things are like, can you unzip my pencil case for me? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm thinking, Mm -hmm. This is something that the child, if they had a moment, they could really think about and problem solve independently. And by the way, problem solving are words that become part of the language mm -hmm. of the lower elementary class. Well, have I problem solved? Have I tried to problem solve? That's right. You don't actually always hear that in other environments. So, well, and it, I have to tell you that as somebody who's hiring folks from all different age levels, we're seeing that with our younger generation, they haven't necessarily had the opportunity to problem solve. So they don't know necessarily how to take initiative in that way mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. And so we're ending up teaching adults those same skills because they didn't get it as children. Right. And, and what, a you know, talk about having to, it's not our brain, brains are plastic. We can still <laughs> learn, but mm -hmm. it's definitely different than doing it during a time where those neural pathways are there to be kept. Yes. They're there. Yes. We have to use them mm -hmm. and really support the children in, I, I consider it to be that we're, our job is to give them as little help as they, as we possibly can 
and still have them navigate the situation, yes. right? And have them make mistakes with problem solving yes. so that they learn. Right. If they're constantly asking an adult for help, right, they will not learn the skill themselves. And when they become adults, when these children, because, you know, eventually we're going to become adults, right? right. That's then right. what are, you're going to still be asking, whether it's your boss or your parent or whoever else That's in right. your life for help your whole life. But how empowering would it be if you could help yourself? That's right. <laughs> you know, so, so. Well, and I want to, I want to underscore also that in the, in your Montessori classroom, you have elders and you have youngers. Yeah. So you're also a part of what you're teaching your children is if they're a younger, they can go to an elder, an elder mm -hmm. can go to another elder, they can ask each other for help. And one of the lessons I really like to see in lower elementary and upper elementary classrooms is the elder supporting the child the smallest amount they possibly can. Mm. It's really easy for the elder to come swoop in and do the whole thing because then it feels really good. Right. Right. Feels good. I did this. It, it's about your own fuel. Yeah. Rather than supporting them in building the skill. Even in children's house, we find that the uh, the great Montessori guide has taught the elder to do the minimal so that the child then can continue to build that skill yes. themselves. Right. Gosh, I love this. I love what you're saying so much because I'm thinking about it as an adult also. Mm -hmm. You know, what what makes a good leader in mm. an organization? It's somebody who does not do all the work themselves, but they teach the people who are coming in after them. Mm. They they support them in those skills and they give them opportunities for practice, for mm. failure, for challenge. Mm -hmm. And they build them up in that way. You know, if you had a boss or a CEO doing everything for you, mm -hmm. your people are never going to learn. And then what's going to happen eventually if you're thinking communally, when it's time for the CEO to go. That's right. What's going to happen to the That's organization? Good, the very whole good thing. Point. So and something that I continue to work on. He's phenomenal at it. No, I was going to say, I, don't know. I know we're not supposed to praise, but <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it, and it's such a gift. It's mm -hmm. such a gift when we have that mentor that really takes our learning as the mentee mm -hmm. so seriously mm -hmm. and also just allows room for growth. Mm -hmm. So yes, when our elders can can give support to our youngers in that way, mm -hmm. that is such mm -hmm. a gift, a lifelong gift. And that's what I keep trying to say. It's this is not just about the lower elementary classroom. It's it's a place where we can start the lessons, but that's these right. lessons become lifelong lessons. Well, so and, and I want to say one more thing since I'm inserting myself here is the other place that I see lower all guides or guides in general can struggle is they will answer for the children sometimes instead of giving yeah. the time for the child to, to, to speak. And that's a part of their social emotional learning as well is for the child to navigate their discomfort. Maybe they may be processing more slow, slowly. They need a little time. And if mm -hmm. somebody comes in and answers the question for them or speaks for them, that part of their brain actually doesn't get built. Yeah. Right. They yes. don't get to hold on to that. Right. So, so I just, just, quickly, I know it's I just so hard to, to get that. off topic with this. We're going to go back to, to okay. reporting in a moment yes. versus okay. tattling. Yes. Um, but you know, even as a therapist, we're actually in our training. We are trained to have that, what we call the awkward silence. Mm. You know, it's, it's not awkward to us, mm -hmm. but we, we as human beings tend to think that silence is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Where really, if you start to view si silence as the time when somebody is being the most creative, the time that they're thinking, mm -hmm. silence is actually what we need in the world. And what what is filling our silence right now? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of technology filling it in. So children are never Noise. children yeah. are never bored. Mm -hmm. And when you're never bored, mm -hmm. what time do we really have to think and to process and mm -hmm. to grow? Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, this is how one lesson goes into another lesson, right. you know, all of a sudden. I love so, that. I love so that. yeah. So yeah. giving that time to think, and even as adults, it can be really, mm -hmm. we think, oh, this, this silence is awkward, but no, it's not. It's our children thinking and processing and using their problem solving skills in real time. And also what a gift for the rest of the group to see that too. Well, and I have to tell you as somebody who, you know, works with groups on zoom and, and, and holds workshops. I have learned that you wait for six seconds and it mm. feels like an eternity, mm -hmm. right? Like it feels yep. so long, but if you ask a question and with children too, you count to six. And then I used to say, I taught lower elementary. 
I would say, would you like us to come back to you? Mm -hmm. And they usually would say yes. And then sometimes they'd say, no, I don't, I don't want to answer it. Okay. That's fine too. Yep. Right. But if you give them six seconds and then you say, would you like us to come back to you? And you give, there's some time for them to process. Cause we have to recognize everybody functions a little differently, Yeah, but it doesn't mean we don't want their voice. Right. The people who think quickly, oftentimes we hear so much from them, but what about the folks who don't think as quickly and yeah. need more time? Those are those deep, those deep waters, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. those, so I just- Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, one lesson to another. One lesson but to anyway, another. But anyway, okay, let's get back to the yes, <laughs> tattling, tattling versus, versus reporting. reporting. So tattling is something that really the child can problem solve on their own mm -hmm. if given the tools mm -hmm. to be able to do mm -hmm. that. And that's part of that lesson. Mm -hmm. What tools- can the guide impart to you mm -hmm. for how to problem solve mm -hmm. independently? Mm -hmm. um, reporting, on the other hand, is it's not a small problem. It's something that is really big on the problem thermometer okay. that that a child could not have the capacity necessarily mm -hmm. to solve independently, or maybe they need some support with that. This could include if somebody is physically hurting you. Oh, for sure. Or yeah, you know, but actually not just physical. Let's say if mm -hmm. somebody's also I I use the language hurting your heart. Mm. You know, if somebody is repeatedly calling you names or mm. saying saying hurtful words to you over and over and over again, and let's say you've tried, you've tried to problem solve on your own mm -hmm. and it's still not stopping. Well, that's time for a report. 100%. So, you know, when somebody mm -hmm. is hurting your body or your heart or mm -hmm. your mind, that's a time when our problem thermometer is actually really, really high. And that's a time where, yes, you ask for help. Mm -hmm. And there should never be any shame in reporting something. And, you know, sometimes a child might not know the difference. If, if maybe something could be tattling, mm -hmm. maybe it could report, be reporting. I don't know. Mm -hmm. If you are really unsure, mm -hmm. then you still report. Actually, one of my best examples and a real life example of this mm -hmm. is in gym. Mm -hmm. Let's say the the group is playing dodgeball mm -hmm. and one friend throws one, one child throws a ball really hard at another and it hurts really bad, almost to the point where it, it seemed targeted, mm -hmm. but it really could have been either way. It could have been, it was the game mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. maybe this child was not following the rules of the game where, you know, you don't hit somebody's head mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's really hard to tell mm -hmm. in that case, I would still say, we would still teach the child. Yes, this is a time when you go and you seek the support of somebody who can help you. Okay. I love that language because mm -hmm. it's a little different than reporting. I think when you say reporting, if I can push back just yeah, a little yeah, here, of course. that it sounds like you're handing it to somebody else to solve. And, and I want to be clear that when we say reporting, what you're really doing is asking for support in solving it. Because mm -hmm. you're not handing it off to the teacher and then all of a sudden you're done and the mm -hmm. teacher then comes in and addresses it. What you're really doing, like in the PE, great example, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we like in here, we're in the podcast room, everything is very easily um, put into categories, but mm -hmm. in real life, it gets a yeah. little more gray. Yeah, absolutely. But, but then when you're reporting this thing, like that, let's say the child comes up and says, so-and-so just threw the ball and it hit me in the head and you see the mark what's really happening is then you're going to support the other, you're going to bring over the other child and you're going to support the two of them in mm -hmm. having a conversation with each other right. in a way that is so that the child who has been quote unquote victimized mm -hmm. is also empowered. Yeah. Every time we as adults, and I know you know this, but for our mm -hmm. listeners, yeah. Uh, every time we as adults run in and fix it and solve it and and have it be that we're giving it we're taking the child out of the equation the victim we are reinforcing their status as a victim because we're not teaching them how to be an advocate for themselves sure. right and so of course there are times like extreme cases right like mm -hmm. extreme cases you don't you don't necessarily bring them together if there is repeated bullying behavior that is targeted and non-accidental non-accidental sexual, non -accidental, sexual harassment like those kind of things I'm not talking about all the time but most like 99% of the time in our lower elementary classrooms mm -hmm. these things are going to be things where you're going to pull both children in and you're going to say 
-hmm. you know, you're going to say, I, I would say to you, um, Jen, Joey just got hit in the head. Mm -hmm. So let's sit down and have a conversation. Can you see his face? And then we want Joey to be able to say, you hit me on purpose. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then this, you know, the, so one of the tools that we use, and we should do a separate podcast on active. active I was just going to say that <laughs> we should, right. It's a, it's a skill in active listening at that point. It is. And that's a whole session yeah. into itself. And we have to make sure that the, that we're supporting the aggressor in building the skills that they need to be socially successful mm -hmm. and supporting the victim in building their advocacy skills mm -hmm. because otherwise, and this is from the bully, the bystander and the, the bully, the bullied and the bystander, I think is the name of the book that I've found really helpful. They carry that with them. Mm -hmm. They continue to be a target. Mm -hmm. And so not that it's, we're getting all into the bullying piece, but we want to have those children who are going to come and tell you also build the skills of how can they yeah. hold that themselves, right? So I want to make sure you have time to wrap up. Anything else you want to say about reporting versus tattling? Yeah, I, I guess one of the, the biggest things that we try to impart to the children is often something that they might feel the urge to tattle for mm -hmm. could also be something that's accidental. If you know, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. that you were tripped by a classmate by accident, even though you might have gotten hurt, what you can report is, I really need to go to the nurse. I need help. But do not put that on the other child as, this child tripped me mm -hmm. because you know it was an accident. So really supporting the child and thinking about, was this something that was on purpose mm -hmm. or an accident? Mm -hmm. Because things happen. And there's a lot of time that I would say is wasted almost in an elementary room where children are, are seeking support for something that really was an accident mm -hmm. and that they still could problem solve themselves. And they know it's an accident. You know? Well, and I think that's so, a part of us as human beings. Yeah. The other day, my daughter dropped something, it landed on my foot mm -hmm. and I- I was, I could yeah. feel anger come up. Right. And right. I wanted to blame somebody, yes. something, right. It's human, it, human nature. And I had to really go, oh my gosh. Right. Like, yeah. you know, and she came over and she said, I'm so sorry. I said, mm -hmm. I know you are. She said, can I give you a hug? I said, can you give me five minutes? Like I couldn't even take a hug right then. I just yeah. had to process and so we have to teach children how to navigate that because they can, sure. big feelings, it's okay to have big feelings, mm -hmm. right? It's okay for you to be angry, upset, frustrated, hurt. And all of those things are completely legitimate when something comes up for you and it's easy and it's such a beautiful distinction to make for them for their lifetime Yeah, that they don't have to then carry that, that like my daughter didn't, of course she didn't mean to. Right? right. We love each other. Mm -hmm. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I love that distinction. Okay. So any last words of wisdom you want to leave us with before we wrap yeah, up? Yeah. I, I would say that just to remember social, emotional learning really is social, emotional language and mm. to make it most effective. It just, it has to become a part of our culture as a classroom, mm -hmm. as much as we possibly can have it become a part of our culture and our parent community, because as we know, the child's development really comes from the guides. It comes from the peers. It comes from the home life too. Mm -hmm. So as much as we can reinforce that language of social emotional learning, that's learned through the explicit lessons mm -hmm. in everyday interactions, mm -hmm. then I believe we will have the most highest chances of success mm. of, of, really bringing that language to our children as a lifelong skill and not just in the moment that they're being taught for it, you know, explicitly themselves. Love so. that. Love that. Yeah. Thank you for being on. Thanks for it's having been me. It's such a pleasure to talk yeah. to you today. It's really, truly, like, really great. Thank you. And thank you all for tuning in. We know that you have so many calls on your time and your attention and, and you're holding so much and you're doing the work. And we are so grateful for each and every one of you and the work you're doing in the world, working with our young people. This is a Montessori revolution. We are better together. Tune in next time to greenspringcenter.org. See you soon.